Dev Call. The Lake by Simon James Collier. I said. There, Lizzie. There. Tis gone from here now. You must have shooed his friend, because the damned creature is still perched there looking right at me. Remove yourself from palace. Take your beak out of my heart and go to hell. You must show no mercy. Be direct. You dare to challenge me in my own home. You dare to engulf me in your black heart. Is it my very soul that you try to imprison? It has been tried before. Better folk than you have challenged me and have borne witness to my wrath. I am not a woman to be toyed with. Lizzie. Only a short while ago... You said, just let be what it is. Indeed. Well, can't you see that that cannot be so? I am unsure as to what you mean. <laughs> this bird, this ebony creature of the grave will not let things be what they are. It cannot let me be with my thoughts of the one I loved, enjoying cherished moments. No, it comes in the night on the wave of a storm and brings with it such feelings of emptiness and wrenching heartache that by design drive a woman to her wit's end. It is a prophet, a thing of evil, a servant of the devil. It has come to torment me for what I have done. Oh, heavens, what have I done? I tried. I tried to take hold of her hand, but the water, it prevented me from securing a grip. Oh, it was such a beautiful afternoon bright sunshine. For a moment I thought that neither of us had a care in the world. It was becoming difficult for me to hide what I had discovered. You see, Doctor, I knew her love for me was waning, that she had affections for another. My jealousy was at times uncontrollable. How dare she do this to me? That was all I could think about. What had made things even worse, if they could be, was that this other was in fact my husband, Sir William. <laughs> How irony rears its ugly head. I had suggested an afternoon on the water. <laughs> Thought it was romantic. That if I could show her how much I loved her, then she would return to me. I know how foolish that sounds, but when you're in love, your heart will play terrible tricks on your mind. Doctor... I hope my confession does not alarm you. But then, the breeze. The breeze caught her parasol, and, and her grasp wasn't enough to hold it. It landed on the water. Only moments earlier, she'd been so still like a mirror. You could consider it and see a perfect reflection. But now, with the wind, there were ripples. Everything became distorted. She reached for the blessed thing. I scolded her, warned her that she would fall in. I remember her laughing at me, her smiling face mocking my warnings, telling me that I didn't have to worry about her, that she could take care of herself. I... I remember getting angry with her, angry at her dismissing my concern. Still, she mocked. There was a disdain in her voice. I... I... I stood suddenly. I, I remember thinking, you shouldn't be doing this standing in a boat. But I was incensed at her defiance. And my mind was filled with an overwhelming rage. How dare she? It was my sole thought. How dare she? She reached out again for the accoutrement, showing absolute indifference to my words. And in anger and with haste, I moved towards her. 
My moving caused the boat to tip, and within moments we were both thrown. I remember thinking how cool and refreshing the water felt against my skin. But that thought quickly vanished, and my one and only concern was for Leonore. The water was clear for a few feet below the surface, but as it became deeper, there was a dark and murky look and feel. I couldn't see anything. I remember breaking the surface and looking around to see if she was there, but other than the upturned boat and a floating oar, it was empty. I swam around to the other side of the craft and called out her name at the top of my voice again and again, but no answer. But then there was a sound of splashing water and I could see her behind me fighting desperately to remain afloat. I swam as fast as I could to get to her. She dipped under the surface time after time, but I knew where she was. As I reached her, she was going under again, but I dove down and grabbed her arm. It was difficult to get a firm grip, but I did. At least I thought I did. The water was clear enough for me to see her face. It was so pale, though the very life was being drained from it. With all my strength, I tried to pull her upwards to the surface. She'd been under for a while and clearly needed air. But no matter how hard I tried, she continued to descend into the darkened depths. With one last pull, I tried to save her, but her garments were so filled with water and heavy, I had not the strength to. As she drifted downwards, her arm reached out to mine, and I swear I could see her beautiful face, one that once brought such an infectious smile, turned from a look of radiance to one of anger, her eyes black, her lips tightly pursed. I couldn't save her, I couldn't. Or didn't I try hard enough? No matter what words of comfort and condolence I hear, I fear she will never forgive me for what has happened. I look within myself and wonder if my thoughts were vengeful at that moment, whether I purposely didn't exert every effort to save her, whether I wanted her to die. After all, if I couldn't have her, then nobody could. I am sure that is not the case, Lizzie. Take thy beak from out of my heart, and take thy form from my door. This was an Epcol Entertainment Clockwork Digital Studios original production. A part of the On Another Wavelength audio anthology series. Featuring the voice talents of Helen Sterling Lane and Mitch Howell. Written by Simon James Collier. Inspired by The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Directed and produced by Simon James Collier. Series created and co-produced by Adam Deschanel. Soundscape design, James Nicholson. Recorded at the Umbrella Rooms, London. Sound engineer, Ben Robbins. (laughs) 